Macedonia had never been more than a Greek backwater, but with the conquests of Alexander the Great in the late 4th century BC, it turned into one of the largest empires in history, stretching from Greece to India. But on June 10th, 323 BC, Alexander the Great would die. The empire would be left with no clear successor, as the Arget family had only seven living members, and only three that were possible successors. Among Alexander's generals, two main factions formed after his death. The first of these was led by Melinger, who supported the candidacy of Alexander's mentally disabled half-brother, Arhidaeus. The second was led by Perdiccas, who believed it best to wait until the birth of Alexander's unborn child by Roxanne. However, both parties would eventually agree to a compromise, where Arhidaeus would be named king as Philip III and would rule jointly with Roxanne's child, providing it was a male heir. Perdiccas was designated as regent of the empire, with Melinger acting as his lieutenant. However, soon after, Perdiccas had Melinger and the other leaders who had opposed him imprisoned and eventually murdered, allowing him to assume full control as regent. The generals who had supported Perdiccas were awarded in the partition of Babylon, becoming satraps of the various parts of the empire. Back in Greece, war had been simmering for years, and once the news of Alexander's death reached them, they revolted, re-establishing the Hellenic League with Athens at the head. The Greeks raised an army under their Athenian commander-in-chief, Leosthenes, and marched to Thermopylae. Subsequently, Antipater, the satrap of Macedonia and Greece, marched to meet him, but due to a Greek cavalry revolt in his army, he was forced to hold up in Lamia, one of the few cities in the region which had remained loyal to the Macedonians. Once the Greeks heard this, they quickly besieged the city and Antipater. While the land army was held up, a large Macedonian fleet arrived from the Levant, commanded by Clytus the White, and gained the Macedonians' naval victories at the battles of Echinades and Amorgos. Meanwhile, on land, Antipater had appealed to Leonatus and Craterus for aid. With the arrival of Macedonian reinforcements, the Greeks lifted the siege and marched on Leonatus's force, who had failed to coordinate his moves with the others, and was decisively defeated by the Greeks, who killed Leonatus during the battle. The next day, Antipater arrived, gathered the remnants of Leonatus's army, and waited for Craterus before marching on the Greeks, they eventually fought at the Battle of Cranon. Relying on his superior Thessalian horsemen, the Athenian general Antiphilus opened the battle with a clash between the Greek and Macedonian cavalry. Once the cavalry of both sides were occupied, Antipater ordered his superior infantry to charge the enemy line. The Athenian infantry was quickly driven back by the more numerous Macedonians and withdrew to high ground, from where they could easily repulse the Macedonian assault. However, seeing their infantry in retreat, the Athenian cavalry disengaged from the battle, leaving the field and handing victory to the Macedonians. While the Athenian-led army was still intact, it was clear that the Macedonians had gained the advantage. Antiphilus therefore sent an embassy to Antipater the next day, asking for terms. Antipater refused to conclude any general peace with the Athenian-led alliance as a whole, instead insisting that each city send its own ambassadors. Athens, eventually abandoned by her allies, was at last forced to surrender unconditionally. Athens would never again play a leading role in Greece. Meanwhile, in Asia, Perdiccas set out to conquer Cappadocia, which remained under Persian rule. However, Antagonus, the Macedonian satrap of Pamphylia and Lycia, was unwilling to support Perdiccas, 
when Perdiccas ordered Antagonus to appear before his court, Antagonus fled to Antipater's court in Macedon. Nevertheless, Perdiccas subjugated Cappadocia, installing Philip and Alexander's former secretary, Eumenes, as a satrap. When he returned to strengthen control over his empire, Perdiccas agreed to marry Nicaea, the daughter of Antipater. However, he broke off the engagement in 322 BC, when Olympias, the mother of Alexander the Great, offered him the hand of Alexander's full sister, Cleopatra. Given the intellectual disability of Philip III and the limited acceptance of the boy, Alexander IV, the marriage would have given Perdiccas a claim as Alexander's true successor, not merely as regent. As a result of these events and actions, Perdiccas earned Antipater's animosity, while Antagonus had reason to fear Perdiccas, and Craterus was also unhappy at being ignored by Perdiccas, despite his important position within the army when Alexander was alive. So Antipater, Craterus, and Antagonus agreed to revolt against Perdiccas. Craterus was designated to lead the large coalition army, which left for Greece almost immediately, intending to overthrow Perdiccas. Perdiccas responded by sending Eumenes and Neoptolemus with an army to the Hellespont in an attempt to prevent Craterus from crossing into Asia. Though before the meeting of the two armies, Neoptolemus, jealous of Eumenes, deserted with a few hundred horse joined forces with Craterus. After the crossing, the two armies met at the Battle of the Hellespont. Both sides stationed their phalanx in the center and cavalry on the wings, with Craterus and Eumenes commanding their own right wing. The cavalry on Eumenes' left flank was composed of Asianistic troops, Eumenes being apprehensive of opposing any Macedonians to a general so popular with his countrymen. As soon as they came in sight of the enemy, they charged the flank of Craterus, which was unable to withstand the shock, and the aged general himself perished in the confusion. With Craterus slain, his cavalry was scattered. On the other wing, Neoptolemus confronted Eumenes, and in single combat, Neoptolemus was killed. Craterus's infantry, by now surrounded and leaderless, surrendered. In late 321 BC, Perdiccas intended to send Alexander's body back to Macedonia, the traditional place of burial for the Macedonian royal family. However, when Alexander's remains were passing through Syria, Ptolemy, the satrap of Egypt, was able to bribe the escort and seize the body. Ptolemy brought Alexander's remains back to Egypt. They were housed in the city of Memphis. Perdiccas regarded Ptolemy's action as an unacceptable provocation and decided to invade Egypt. When Perdiccas reached the most easterly tributary of the Nile, he marched upstream to find a suitable point to cross. Soon coming across the ford, which was defended by a small Egyptian force known as the Camel's Rampart. But soon it was reinforced by a larger army under Ptolemy, denying Perdiccas an easy victory. Despite this disadvantage, the attack proceeded, but Perdiccas would be overwhelmed and forced to retreat. Continuing along, he would find another crossing near Memphis. Perdiccas placed his elephants upstream of this new crossing, so as to block the current that would otherwise sweep away his men. He would also place his cavalry downstream to catch any unlucky enough to be swept away regardless of the elephant's makeshift dam. For a time, this worked, enabling a sizable contingent of Perdiccas' army to cross the river and reach an island at its center. However, the elephants began to sink in the mud of the riverbed, and the currents rose quickly. This proved to be a disaster for Perdiccas, as he had to abandon the crossing, leaving many of his infantry stranded on the island. 
Perdiccas was left with no choice but to recall the men. Most of this contingent drowned trying to make it back to the eastern bank. Following what was so far a disastrous campaign, a mutiny broke out amongst Perdiccas' soldiers, who were disheartened by his failure to make progress in Egypt. Perdiccas was murdered by his officers. His officers and the rest of his army then defected to Ptolemy. Ptolemy came to terms with Perdiccas' murderers, making Patheon and Arhideus regents in Perdiccas' place. But soon they came to a new agreement with Antipater at the Treaty of Triparadesis. Antipater was made regent of the empire, and the two kings were moved to Macedon. Antagonus was made strategus of Asia and remained in charge of Phrygia, Lycia, and Pamphylia, while the three murderers of Perdiccas, Seleucus, Patheon, and Antagonis were given the provinces of Babylonia, Media, and Susiana. Arhideus, the former regent, received Hellespontine Phrygia. Antagonus was charged with the task of rooting out Perdiccas' former supporters. As although the first war ended with the death of Perdiccas, his cause lived on. Eumenes was still at large with a victorious army in Asia Minor. So were Alcetus, Atalus, Dokimos, and Polemon, who had also gathered their armies in Asia Minor. In 319 BC, Antagonus, after receiving reinforcements from Antipater's European army, first campaigned against Eumenes marching against him at the Battle of Orkneia. Eumenes outnumbered Antagonus in infantry and cavalry. Despite this, Antagonus adopted a bold attacking strategy. Antagonus drew up his phalanx twice as long as usual, tricking his opponent into thinking he had twice as much infantry. Before the battle had even began, Antagonus got in touch with Eumenes' cavalry officer Apollondes who was willing to change sides. Once Eumenes' massive disposition became apparent, his army fled. The victory of Antagonus was decisive. His smaller army slew about 8,000 of the retreating enemy and captured Eumenes' baggage train. However, the latter was still able to escape with a substantial body of troops. In the retreat, managed to capture and kill the traitor Apollondes. Though eventually Antagonus caught up with Eumenes, who was forced to take refuge in the stronghold of Nora, with his closest followers, a some 600 men. There, Antagonus watched him closely, but the fortress was well stocked and virtually impregnable. Antagonus left the siege of Nora to a subordinate and marched with the bulk of his army to deal with the remaining Perdicians who were holed up in a pass near the town of Credopolis. Antagonus decided to use the element of surprise and force marched his army to Credopolis, covering roughly 300 miles in seven days. In this way, Antagonus took his enemies by complete surprise. They faced an assault in front along the pass and in the flank from the hills overlooking the pass. Leaving Atalos and Dokimos to draw up the phalanx, Alcetus took the cavalry in the Peltas and attacked Antagonus's troops on the ridge, trying desperately to dislodge them. During the fight for the ridge, Antagonus charged with his 6,000 cavalry into the pass and caught Alcetus in the flank. At this, Alcetus was forced back from the ridge and just barely made it back to the phalanx the loss of most of his men. Unfortunately for the Perdicians, they did not have enough time to drop their phalanx, and facing Antagonus's cavalry charge, their men simply surrendered. Alcetus managed to escape with a small guard, he made his way to the almost impregnable city of Teramisos, where he would commit suicide. His colleagues, however, were captured by Antagonus along with the rest of the army. Antagonus could now claim to have destroyed the Perdiccian faction, but unfortunately for him, Eumenes was not done causing trouble.